Right, I've tried to do this video once before and it didn't quite pan out. Hopefully it isn't cursed. Anyway, let's give it another go. Netta Yoroze! Two words that will be pretty familiar to many, in particular anyone who so happened to be playing demo discs from the official PlayStation magazine back in the day. Along with demos of whatever new games were on the way, there would usually be some game on there made by… well, who knows who. And they wouldn't have all the videos and the fancy graphics of the big physical releases or anything, but sometimes they would be pretty good in their own right. It is funny really. We may never have had a chance to see any of these games at all, and indeed we didn't see about 90% of them if not more. But certain things conspired to make at least a little bit of the stuff that came from Netyorozi visible. I certainly have fond memories of a lot of Netyorozi games. And so without further ado, let's take a look back at it. Netyorozi, a slang term meaning let's do it together in Japanese, is the name given to one of the most special PS1s of them all, the Black Console. The consumer dev kit, augmented with the Netuozi SDK, debugging features, lots of documentation, a comms cable to link the PS1 up to a PC, and no region lockout. This console, available by mail order only, was a snip at £550 on launch, and it's more than retained that value. A complete black console is worth well over a grand, seeing as you would need the documentation, boot disk, software disk, cable and so forth for it to be of any worth beyond just being a very fancy region 3 PS1. The main aim of this was, of course, not anything mass market. It was something designed to be of interest for anyone who fancied developing for the system, and possibly for universities who could use the Eurozy to teach programming and game design. While back in the 90s there were but a mere handful of universities teaching games technology courses of any description across the entire world, a chunk of the few that were there were heavily backed and supported by Sony through Eurozy PS1s, especially in Japan, which was most certainly the world leader at the time when it came to a game-centric education. There was certainly no thought of the Eurozy being a moneymaker. Reportedly an idea of Ken Kutuagi himself, it was something for the future. Hell, some people who ended up ordering a Eurozy back in the day have since reported that Sony never actually charged them for it. Netuozi has been described in some circles as the first consumer dev kit for a console, although this is not true. It is predated by things like, in particular, Devolo for the PC engine. However, Netuozi is one of the most well-known examples and pretty much the first in the West. It's a definite forerunner to things like Microsoft's XNA. The Netuozi obviously wasn't capable of producing games like Final Fantasy VII or whatever, but it was probably more powerful than you thought it would be. In terms of restrictions, it was less about direct controls and more about slight limitations. For example, Netuozi users had access to 3.5 megabytes of RAM, including 1 megabyte of VRAM and half a meg of sound RAM, which is the same as anyone else had to develop with on the system. However, the Netuozi environment itself would eat up a quarter of that. The software itself would also not be as wide ranging, of course, mostly consisting of old standbys such as Code Warrior and a fairly limited Lightwave 3D, with no prospect for making any dev software of your own as such. The biggest difference, though, is that Netuozi users were not able to burn their games to a CD meaning that you would never be able to stream anything off a CD, and a program would have to exist entirely in the aforementioned 3.5 megs of RAM. More than anything else, that is the obvious big limitation on Eurozy, something that Sony didn't want to allow as it would mean that Eurozy users could potentially create commercially releasable material, and Sony wouldn't have any quality control over it. However, there are also big benefits to this such as the standard coding environment that all Eurozy users had to use. This was particularly beneficial to novices, to which a non-standardised coding environment, such as the PC, could be somewhat imitating. For the first couple of years, the Net Eurozy community was basically its own locked-off island. Being a registered Net Eurozy user did invite you into a hub where you could have your own page, communicate with other Net Eurozy users via Usenet forums, and share games with each other. But these games could only be played by another person who also had a Net Eurozy machine. You can be sure that there were quite a few people with more money than sense who heard about the Eurozy, got crazy visions of making something like the next Tomb Raider or whatever, and bought one only to find that 
you know, even programming basic games is difficult, and programming something like a Len AAA title by yourself on your Ozzy was basically impossible. Other than that, there were the more grounded new programmers, the more experienced people playing around with a new environment, and the various levels in between. For the most part though, Yuozi attracted young novices who were willing to learn and enticed by the thought of making a game for a console. For a lot of people in the West, this would have been the first time that such a thing would have been thrown open to the public like this. All Yuozi users could access each other's pages around the world, although there were big differences between the core three regions. A big chunk of Yuozi's users, about a thousand or so, were in Europe, where SCEE heavily supported the Yuozi community throughout its lifetime, even right up to the final server shutoff, which actually happened as late as 2009. America, by comparison, was somewhat barren. While the user base there was about the same size as it was here, it seems as though SCEA did not offer the same level of support for the machine, nor did they market it all that much. Japan was the wild card. While communication with the Japanese users was clearly limited through the language barrier, and all of the Japanese Yuozi pages, games and whatever being in Japanese, the Japanese Yuozi games that came out are probably the most advanced of them all. A chunk of this has to do with the local support from Sony itself, heavily integrating Yuozi into game design courses over there, and even bringing it into a few schools. Still, for the first couple of years, the whole thing was closed off. As mentioned, you needed a net Yuozi machine to play these games, so none of them really left the community. And then, in late 1997, this changed with the inclusion of at least one, and sometimes more, Netuozi games on the UK official PlayStation magazine's demo discs. Suddenly, these games would get a much bigger audience. The UK official PlayStation magazine was, at the time, one of the biggest selling video game magazines in the entire world, routinely shifting 150,000 mags every month. A Metal Gear Solid cover issue in 1999 sold a staggering 450,000 copies, that was enough to beat the mainstream lads mags with girls breasts on them. It's a mark that I doubt any games magazine in Europe reached before, and certainly none will come close to reaching again. As much as NetUOSI is internet based and we're right in the middle of the dot com boom here, the 32 bit era is the last one where the magazine is still kin, and UK PSM is one of the last magazines to have such a big commercial impact. By the time of the switch from PS1 to PS2, the internet was more than beginning to take hold. So getting exposure in a magazine like this was naturally a big deal, and of course it did bring a lot more interest about in NetUOSI as a platform. Still, the UK PSM demo discs only represent a very small chunk of the amount of Uozi games that were actually made. Over the course of the magazine, 37 Uozi games made it onto the demo discs. It is unknown exactly how many Uozi users there were around the world, but a fair estimate would probably be between 5,000 and, at very generously, 7,000, and they certainly released hundreds of games. A couple of unofficial discs do exist that generally cover the best of the Yuozi games, but with the Net Yuozi servers closed for good in 2009, the majority of the Net Yuozi games are quite possibly lost forever. Natural successors to the service, such as Xbox Live Indie Games, have obviously been a lot more open with all games available on the Xbox Marketplace, and developers receiving 70% of a game's sales. Back in the 90s though, that sort of thing was obviously a bit trickier. Right, well, with all that said, it's time to look at some NetUOZ games. I have a bunch here, most of them from PSM demo discs, including one of the compilation discs that they themselves released that, again, covers a lot of the best UOZ games. Sony also did a few of these in Europe. If you bought the mag back in the day, then doubtless you'll recognise a few of these titles. And some of the stories behind them are also pretty interesting. So, without any further ado, let's go! We kick off with Adventure Game, certainly a unique title. This odd little thing is less of a proper game and more of a play around with RPG cliches, an obvious plot, some amusing puzzles, and a sledgehammer to the fourth wall. If you like such exercises in parody, then it's perhaps worth seeking out. Of course, you do have to remember the limitations with all of these games. This is definitely one of the better Yuozi games, even if it doesn't exactly look hot now. It is kind of funny though. 
Adventure Game was made in four weeks by a man named Robert Swan, who would actually land himself a job inside of Sony Europe. Much later on, he founded an indie studio called R Games, who, funnily enough, released a couple of titles on the Xbox Live Indie Game Service. Okay, um, before the next game, I think this next one probably wants an epilepsy warning. Just, yeah, be careful. If you're ready for it, then we'll go in three, two, one. Good lord. This is Between the Eyes, a very strange tunnel racer that I do believe was the first Heroes game to be released on a PSM demo disc. It moves at a stupidly fast speed, has tons of textures just chucked at it, and the ship that you're flying takes on the textures too. It, um, it's certainly fast, and it's certainly a good programming exercise, but it's not really a feast for the eyes, even as far as Net Eurozy games go. I seem to recall playing this a fair bit back in the day, although I do struggle with it now. One positive about the game is that it does allow you to put your own music CDs into it and play them, which can be fun. You can use the game as a sort of crude visualiser. Okay, here's Blitterboy Operation in Monster Mall. This is one of the bigger Eurozy games, and arguably the best to come out of the UK. It's an arena shooter style game. You go around the play area collecting babies and protecting them from monsters, most of whom look a fair bit like Pac-Man ghosts. Once you warp them out of the area, you then kill all the monsters on the field before warping out yourself. It's simple, fun and addicting, with a bunch of cool weapons and excellent graphic effects. The sort of game that if it had been released on, say, the Amiga, would quite possibly be hailed as a classic. Chris Chadwick developed the game over nearly a year and was rewarded for his efforts with first prize in the 1998 Game Developer UK competition and a cheque for £6,000. Since then he has stayed active in the indie world and in coding communities such as Blitz Basic. Blocks is next, a simple puzzle game where you have to use shapes to create 3 by 3 cubes, some of which may have special features ranging from rockets that cut through the screen to reversing your controls. If you've ever played the game Chime, it's sort of similar to that. The author was a man named Daniel M. Johnson, and it appears to be a remake of a game that he made for the Acorn Archimedes back in 1994. Bouncer 2, a game by Scott Evans, is kind of interesting. It's Breakout mixed with the old circus game, you know, the one where two people bounce on a seesaw. This game is pretty freaking tough. The seesaw makes it hard enough, and it's a challenge to actually not just get stuck in the same spot. Fortunately, there's a little jet you can use to help with movement, and mastering it is essential to get in anywhere. Like many of these games, it's not exactly going to set the world on fire, but it's a fun enough excursion for 10 minutes. Ok, so Net Eurozy obviously wouldn't be complete without an attempt at an FPS. Clone is the one that got pulled out of the bag by PSM. It's simple enough, but weirdly creepy in a very homebrew type way. Those clones are just freaky and inverted. Aside from that, it's a very simple FPS, just the one texture for the walls, the typical controls, and one sound in particular that's straight up ripped from Doom. <laughs> the game was programmed by Stuart Ashley who, like Robert Swan, ended up at SCEE. He would join Team Soho and work on The Getaway, and from there go to Team Bondi, where he would be one of the technical directors on LA Noir. On we go then, with Decay in Orbit, which is one of the more successful games to come from the American region. It's a space shooter that usually has you shoot enemies and light up beacons before landing on your target planet, and the controls are very frosty asteroidsy. Certainly a lot of work went in the game, especially on the story front, and the graphics are pretty nice too. Am I a fan of it? Yeah, it's okay, although I think the controls could do with being a lot less sensitive. Most of the time I do end up having to restart simply through leaving the play area. Decay in Orbit was made by Dragon Show Industries and, in particular, a man named Scott Cartier, who continued to make games on the side before forming Order of Magnitude in 2011 and releasing a couple of mobile titles. Right, it's time for some cave flying, which obviously means it's time for some gravitation. Another take on the classic thrust formula, gravitation mostly focuses on racing through gates, although there is also an even better dogfight mode available. 
At any rate, you need a second player in order to do much of anything with the game, but if you had one, yeah, it's pretty good. Kind of like the old Amiga classic Gravity Force 2. Not bad. Gravitation was made by James Shaughnessy over just a few weeks, and he went on to work at places like Codemasters. One of the most popular NetUOZ games of them all, a modern sequel, Supergrav, was successfully greenlit and released on Steam in November of 2016. Games don't get much simpler than Haunted Maze. Collect objects, avoid enemies, find the exit. As straightforward as the game gets, there is something very enticing about it. Maybe it's the speed, or the game getting zombie AI pretty spot on, or the stock spooky music. Something about the whole package is intriguing, and as a result Haunted Maze is regarded as one of the best NetUOZ games, especially if you use the analogue controller which, I have to say, I'm not here. It's certainly not bad for something made in about two weeks. It's, um, yeah, awesomely strange. Next up, Hover Car Racing. A straight top-down racer, no messing. There's some odd features here. You can make little upgrades to your car, and you can even earn a bit more money through playing a basic version of Columns. The game itself is pretty easy, mind. Unfortunately, your opponents do seem to get stuck on some part of the track quite easily, which is a bit of a shame as it reduces the challenge somewhat. Not really considered the best of Eurosia, it has to be said, unlike a similarly named title. Hover Racing is a game from Japan. They didn't come around often, but a lot of the ones that did were usually quality. It feels kind of unfair to compare something like Hover Car Racing to this, a game that is basically a homage to F-Zero only in 3D. And geez, it does a pretty freaking great job for only having 2 megabytes to play with. The controls can be a little fiddly, but the speed is there, as are the tracks. It's not the most famous Eurosy game to come from Japan, and we'll get to that one, but it assuredly takes second place. Amazingly, this game never made it to the PS1 demo discs despite being easily one of the most advanced Eurosy games of them all. The only thing I can think of is that maybe for PSM the game was perhaps a little bit too close to F-Zero for comfort. The author, Sato Torakatsu, does not appear to have any other credits or any internet presence. The Incredible Cone Man is another alright game as well. This is a 3D Pac-Man clone, and honestly the graphics are pretty damn fine for Eurozy. The controls and the general play aren't bad too. Of course it's Pac-Man so there's not a whole lot that's new here, but considering that NetUOZ is a learning environment more than anything else, this is a fine piece of work. Sadly, the author of The Incredible Cone Man, the awesomely named Lars Barstad, does not appear to have any other credits in the industry. Now, a collection like this would not be complete without a super duper casual puzzle game. And here it is Mahjong. There's not a whole lot to say, really. It is single player Mahjong and I'm very bad at Mahjong. I know that you have to match tiles and all that, but I'm not very good at actually working out which tiles I should match next. The game is okay enough for what it is, but it is maybe a bit of a shame that Liss got on a PSM cover disc and something like Hover Racing didn't. Okay, back to action. Opera of Destruction is actually a really cool idea. There's two cities, one that you have to defend and the other you have to attack. You attack using a jet that can blast buildings to oblivion with a simple gun, and defend using two gun posts against enemy ships that look suspiciously like TIE Fighters. Obviously there is still work to be done here. Your jet can use bombs too, although there doesn't seem to be much point to me when the gun is so overpowered, it can literally destroy cities in seconds. So perhaps that should have been more for dogfights against the enemy. But the action here is still fast and furious, and it all works out quite well indeed. Not bad. Some more puzzle action here, with Pandora's Box. Pretty simple really, it's a Sokoban style crate shoving game, only it's in full 3D. This can make things a bit more challenging, as you need a little bit more spatial awareness in order to complete a level properly, and the time limits are very tight. Other than that, it's a load of shoving of crates. If you like Sokoban type games, then you're gonna like this. Naturally, I'm always going to be more welcome into the action titles, and Psycon is one of my favourites from NetUOZ. Yeah, it's pretty much exactly like the Amiga classic Alien Breed, only without the aliens. 
But I love alien breed, so obviously I get a kick out of this too. It's dark, the gun effects are loud, there's serious maze action and tons of enemies to kill, and an awesome late 90s photoshop effect on the game over screen. It's all jolly good shooty fun, and I always dug it back in the day. Pushy 2 is, uh, yeah. Seeing as I've already covered Pandora's box and this is another crate shove game, I just don't have too much to say about it. It's 2D in the classic top-down formula. Like most Sokoban games, it's fun for a little while, but for me, once I've played one generic crate shoving game, I've kind of played most of them, aside from the almighty adventures of Lolo. Eh, hey ho, again, it's Yuozi, you get games like this. Speaking of classic puzzle formulas, the title of Rocks and Gems should make it fairly obvious that Boulder Dash is about to get the Yuozi treatment. I like Boulder Dash, so I'm pretty okay with this. It's a fast and quite sensitive game, although you can fix that if the movement is too finickety for your liking. It doesn't exactly stand out from the myriad of Boulder Dash clones out there, but it's alright if you like the formula. The author of this game, Gerhard Rittenhofer, is one of the only people, if not the only one, to get two Yuozi games onto a PSM cover disc, having also made Mahjong. And so we finally reach Terra Incognita. I well remember this one coming on the same demo disc as Metal Gear Solid, so naturally a lot of people got their eyes on this one. And geez, I mean, comparing it to most other Yuozi games is almost unfair. Look at it. The animation, the graphics, the music, the interface, it's a level above. I can imagine most people in the community just staring at it, wondering how the hell these guys did it. Of course there are some silly things to laugh at, like the blob enemies, or the hilarious English translation, but geez, just think about it. It's a Yuozi game and there's an English translation. This is the sort of game that, obviously with more polish, could be the demo for a major action RPG. Again, it's just incomparable to most everything else that people were doing here. A simply unbelievable effort on the platform. It goes without saying that Terror Incognito is one of the most successful games ever to come from NetUOZ. The game was authored by Team Fatal, which in the main consisted of a man named Mitsuru Kamiyama. Team Fatal also offered a demo of something called Fatal Fantasy 7, which you can see here. Kamiyama would ultimately land a job at Square Enix, and would become the director of the Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles series of handheld RPGs, and nowadays you can play Terror Incognito on iOS and Android. This A to Z of selected Yuozi titles is ending really strong. Time Slip may look like one of the crudest Yuozi titles yet, and it wasn't often that you got a decent platformer on there. However, it has the most creative gameplay idea of almost any Yuozi game. The whole principle of the game is that you create copies of yourself with every minute you spend in a level, and you use these copies to get through the stage, standing them on triggers and what have you. The challenge is that you have to backtrack a lot while avoiding all the copies of yourself. If you touch one, it's an immediate game over. A lot of games have played around with time mechanics, especially since Braid, but geez, how often did you see this sort of thing in 1997? It's a pretty wonderful concept, that's for sure. The developer of Time Slip, David Johnston, still works in indies under the name of Smudged Cat Games. A remake of Time Slip was released onto Xbox Live Indie Games in 2010. And finally we come to another highly advanced Yuozi game, and one that is probably my favourite, Total Soccer. Back in the PS1 era there were plenty of efforts to make a footy game like the arcade classics of old, the senses and kickoffs and what have you. The end result of this to be honest was usually utterly terrible. And in the end, pretty much all of these efforts, including one by Sensible Software themselves, they were all completely outdone by a single coder with not but a couple of megabytes to work with. This is a great top-down footy game, a solid challenge with an intelligent opponent, fast and creative play, tons of teams and tactics, a practice mode, very satisfying goals thanks to the aftertouch. It has more than a bit of the sensey magic. It's really fun to play matches, especially as they are all so high scoring, without the ability to just run past the keeper like he's not there. Much like Terror Incognita, Total Soccer feels like an excellent demo for a full release title, like you're watching the engine at work. 
It's very impressive indeed, and it brought the coder, Charles Chapman, a great deal of deserved credits. Total Soccer is quite possibly the most successful game to come out of NetEurosi, being the only one that actually spawned something of a franchise. Charles Chapman would quickly find himself signed up by Exeunt, where he would spend the next 10 years. The game was ported to the Game Boy Color and released as David O'Leary Total Soccer 2000, back in the days when literally anyone who'd ever kicked a ball about could get a game named after them. There's also a Total Soccer 2002, with the much more palatable support of Steven Gerrard. More than that though, the Total Soccer engine would, with several revisions, become the staple of FIFA's handheld versions for the rest of the decade. It was used quite a lot. These days, Charles Chapman heads up a studio named First Touch Games, known for sports games like Dream League Soccer on iOS and Android. Actually, this list wouldn't be complete without one more title. I said earlier that NetEurosi was designed and limited in such a way that would prevent it from producing much in the way of commercially sellable games on the PlayStation. With the last title, we did see a port to the Game Boy Color, but that's as far as we've got. But then there's a tiny handful of games that came up from Eurosi and bucked the trend completely, being so good and polished that Sony decided, you know what? This can go on a full release. And the best known of these is undoubtedly Devil Dice, a puzzle game that enjoyed a worldwide release in 1998, ended up selling over a million copies, and aside from the CD music and little FMVs the game, as with all Eurosi titles, exists entirely in the PS1's RAM. The object of Devil Dice is to roll dice around the field and create clusters or lines of die where the top faces are the same and match the number on said top face. You can roll them or, if you get on the floor, push them. It's a fiendish little idea because it can be really hard. You don't know exactly how unfamiliar you are with the layout of a dice until you play this and start rolling die around in a panic, but when you get in the game's mindset and start chaining combos together, it's as satisfying as any puzzle game around. It's fast, challenging and utterly addictive, and there's lots of modes to play with too. From a traditional endless mode, to a battle mode, a load of puzzles, all sorts. It's an excellent game, the most polished Uozi release of them all, and it definitely deserved its success. It's one for your collection for sure, although it has retained its value somewhat. It's about £20 or so. You could also get the just as good sequel, Bombastic, for the PlayStation 2. Devil Dice's developers, Shift, are still around making games today, although most of them only get released in Japan. And so that's a look at a whole bunch of Eurozy games, from the unbelievable trailblazers to the ones in the middle of the pack. It should be noted that again, this is barely scratching the surface. This is mostly just games that appeared on PSM demo discs, and there is so much more to net Eurozy than that. In total, there's probably about 100, maybe even 150 total games from the Eurozy archives kicking about, some of which are just as advanced as the likes of Hover Racing and Terror Incognita, not to mention a fair bit of demo scene type stuff, or riffs on already released games that you would obviously never see on a PSM cover disc, a la Fatal Fantasy. There are still people kicking through the archives in search of anything that could still be out there, whether it's trying to compile files into something usable via emulator, seeing if schools and universities still have their Eurozy material locked away in a cupboard somewhere, or contacting the old authors to see if they've still got discs of their work kicking around. Still, it is pretty unlikely that we will ever have a complete collection of Eurozy, or even close to one. The question now then is, what exactly is NetUOZ's legacy? Some will look at these games and perhaps not be all that impressed. I mean, I've looked around and I've seen threads and such that are basically dedicated to ripping on these games. This is, not to be too blunt about it, frankly a load of bullshit. People kind of forget or just don't know what NetUOZ was all about. In the main, it was a means for people to learn how to code and specifically how to code for games. A lot of the games you see here no doubt come from people who hadn't coded at all before they picked up Eurozy. It may well be their first games full stop. It's easy to mock, but you kind of forget that. Everyone has to start somewhere, and everyone has to learn the basics. Is there anything groundbreaking about a Pac-Man clone, or a Border Dash clone? Well, no. But if you're learning how to make games, it'll be one of the first things you do, to understand how it was made, why it works, and what the mechanics were behind it.
Nettiwozi came at a time when, outside of Japan, there were very few courses dedicated to any kind of game design or programming, and the effect it had on said courses was pretty seismic. Of course, you could point to things like Devolo as predating it, or even to the bedroom coders of the 1980s and ask whether it was all that revolutionary. But the former was very localised, and the latter, well it didn't change anything when it came to the actual teaching of games. Bedroom coders existed in spite of that, coding in schools then was still all about productivity. Netuozi was a big step in getting people into making games for consoles, and in getting people to teach that too. And unlike computers, it's not like there's all these other things you can teach people to code for. So the legacy of Uozi is pretty hefty. There's a little bit of it in all the many programs that have been made over the years that are designed to get people into game design and coding, whether it's the old XNA, or Blitz, or Game Maker, or Wenpai, or Construct, or Unity. There's tons of them now, just like there's tons of games focused courses, and Netuozi was a trailblazer for that. For Sony, the legacy of Uozi is kind of odd, but certainly there. They certainly could have continued to try and have a big chunk of the market for themselves with Uozi being such a trailblazer. From a more cynical point of view, they could have tried to control that market with further evolutions of Uozi on future platforms. But they kind of didn't do that, they pretty much gave it up. The PS2 did have options for those who wanted to code for the machine at home, such as YA Basic and Linux for PlayStation 2. But they weren't really anything like Netuozi. They were a lot more open for a start, and that was always going to be the future. So they gave up the market. While the PS3, and in particular the PS4, are generally regarded as solid console platforms for the indie developer, a lot less horror stories about Sony are out there as opposed to ones about Microsoft. Nowadays, the big market for the single indie developer is going to be on mobile, where the odd utterly simple game can occasionally just come out of nowhere and catch fire. In the main, well a lot more people create games now. People who know nothing about coding have ideas for games, and they're able to execute them. Sure some people do abuse that, but for every guy out there who's flipping assets and trying to con people with unplayable garbage, there are dozens of people who are just using these tools to get better, to make games because they want to make games. And that can't not be a good thing. Bye for now. Thanks for watching this video. On the end screen you can see all the usual options such as watching another video, a link to my channel and also a link to my Patreon account which is where you can get on the list of the great and the good you see scrolling there. If you follow any of these options then thank you so much. And also don't forget that you can win the bell too. See ya!